This episode is sponsored by David Davies of Sun Life Financial. For all your financial advice needs, call David at 519-660-6798 or email david.davies at sunlife.com. Book your appointment today and get started on achieving your financial goals. And by Nick Davies, Andrea Davies, and their team at Homology Real Estate Group make the buying and selling of real estate as cost-effective, informative, and straightforward as possible while maintaining the highest level of service. If you want to maximize your home's value, call Homology Real Estate Group today. Alrighty, Peter. We've uh, we've done a couple of these so far, and uh, yep. surprise, surprise, you and I talked a little hockey the first couple times around. So, yeah. uh, at uh, at th- those <laughs> who don't know, uh, Peter has been obviously a very well-rounded sports fan his entire life. He can pretty much talk about anything. Yeah. Uh, those who know me usually think between you and I doing a post-game show after the night's games uh, and myself doing play-by-play of Junior B, they think that pretty mm-hmm. much the only thing I like is hockey, um, <laughs> which I enjoy my hockey. Don't get me wrong. Um, and I could bring up a picture uh, of a, a, a very young Ryan Robinson. Uh, I won't because I'm in charge of editing um, because <laughs> I don't want to embarrass myself. Uh, but baseball has been my love since I can remember. Do you um, still play it? I know you're, you're playing uh, soft. Uh, I, I, I play I play the, uh, the, the what some people call the easier version of baseball, which is slow pitch. Yeah. Um, it, I just I always played left field. If once I realized that I wasn't good enough to actually do anything with it, I said, okay, let's not be crazy. Right. Um, you know, I, I got a chance to play with a couple guys uh, in and around the area that were pretty darn good back in the day. And I went, well, I'm not as good as them. And when mm-hmm. you are on a team for the Oak Ridge uh, minor baseball system and Brock Kildegard is throwing a baseball on the mound and you're going, I'm not as tall as him and I do not play this game as well as him. I think it might be time for me to go with that whole talking thing that I do a little better. So, um, baseball has been a love from from a very young age. So, uh, to my maybe at my beck and call, I said to Pete, I think we might need to just foray outside of hockey a little bit. And sure, said, sure. Who do we have in mind, and I went, I know exactly who I want to talk to. Uh, is uh, a, a very big part of the London baseball community, um, and uh, we're, we're lucky enough, Peter. Yeah. Um, we're taking the show international. Yes, we are. And we're going to go to Korea. And yes. for those who don't know, ladies and gentlemen, Jamie Romack, a London native and uh, everybody around town in the baseball community absolutely loves Jamie for everything he's done in his career. But uh, Jamie is over in Korea, uh, just went over there a couple weeks ago. Um, he is, uh, I don't want to say enjoying quarantine because uh, Jamie has had to quarantine for about a week and a half now. Yeah. Uh, Jamie Romack, ladies and gentlemen, what uh, Jamie first take us through what uh, this kind of last couple weeks we'll, we'll talk about last year and uh, and everything else uh, in a little bit, but take us through what the, this process has been like for you in the last couple of weeks because uh, this is no no small task. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, and, and thank you for the warm introduction. Um, it has, uh, you know what, it, it really has been not so bad at all, just because our team has placed the foreign group of us, uh, which includes myself and one other foreign guy. Unfortunately, our third guy is, is stuck with some visa issues right now, but we have a foreign coach as well, and then um, kind of the translating coordinator for us and one of the other translators. So there's Right now, there's there's five of us spread in two apartments, and we have an open area, um, kind of between the two, where we're 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 by law doing the right things, but we're secluded, but we're doing it together. Yeah. So, um, for my sanity's sake, I'm not stuffed in a hotel room by myself. Um, we have a kitchen. We can order groceries, things like that. So. We're eating well. I think I'm going to need the two months of spring training to get myself in shape after two months how I've been eating. But uh, we're we're doing just fine. It it, it really um, took a flight over and and they picked us up immediately. Did a COVID test. Um, they kind of whisked us away and and put us on a bus right to our spot. And then they come and check on us and we do three times a day temperature checks that we have to report. And we've been told that really at any time they can come over and, and check on us too. So just stay in your rooms basically. Um, but we've got sunshine and palm trees to look at out the window. And uh, so, so far so good. How does it, uh, is it warm? Is it warm as well? I would say so. Like coming from 
where I was coming from in London <laughs> and where you guys are. Yeah, it's uh, like today's about 10 degrees and, and sunny. So yeah. it's it's a win. I'm not, I won't be going for a swim, but it's no. nice enough. Yeah, it sure is. You know, you're, you're, yeah, I'll, I'll get into this later maybe, but you're a continuation of, of, of Londoners who have made the, uh, the major leagues. Uh, Frank Coleman was with the New York Yankees when I first came here to this town. And Tommy Burgess is another one who played for the LA angels and, and, uh, and Mike Lumley got to a triple a with the, in the Detroit organization. So and then throw in your, good, your good buddy, Adam Stern. We, we got to, I know full well, yeah. we got to give yeah, Stern. Adam Stern. Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. And Chris Robinson as well. And yeah, that's you know, right. Th there's, the baseball community in London, we have a lot of pride in what you're talking about. And, and it's not, you don't have to have reached the big leagues. There's plenty of other guys that played at a very high level of professional baseball and were pretty well accomplished players that all came from this area. And it's something that we talk about at times is, you know, in London and, and area, let's say from the population that we're pulling from, what we've been able to do collectively in terms of in the baseball world, world where you say like versus the GTA, um, it's it's pretty impressive. And, and it really extends westward too. the amount of players that have come out of the Western counties area, the small towns of Wyoming and Petrolia and Sarnia down um, through Chatham and Windsor. It really that area really is a, a, has become a baseball hotbed. Yeah, it sure has. And that's, that's great for the kids. So, you know, not everyone plays hockey and not everybody. Although I think, I think, did you play, did you play some hockey? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I played hockey. It was, you know, traditional Canadian kid growing up um, yep. baseball in the summertime and then hockey in the wintertime. Yeah. Okay. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. And I've talked to, and I won't mention which person gave me this, uh, this, this nugget of information, <laughs> you, might, you probably might know. Uh, he, he, he would always say to me, he goes, we, we always loved Romac as a kid, but we also hated him at times. Cause he was just too good at almost everything <laughs> that he was just naturally athletic that even if we were just playing pickup or something like that, he'd probably find a way to beat us, even though, uh, <laughs> I, I, I won't, uh, we'll, we'll call him Mike be um but uh you know take us through what uh what, what that because uh, I, I always love asking this especially you know athletes at such a high level sort of thing you know at what point did it kind of go from you know as you say typical canadian kid having fun throwing the ball around uh you know playing some uh so playing some minor ball with your kind of area group here in town to you know at what point did you go this is going from having a little fun to this might be something serious kind of thing uh when i was four yeah, when, when my, when, yeah. I mean, if you ask my mom, she'll tell you from from the first time I played t-ball. That's all. Like I, I was going to be a baseball player. That's what I said I wanted to do. Um, if you ask all of my teachers through elementary school on every report or whatever writing I had to do, that was that was it. It never. I never really wavered on that. There were times where. I started to enjoy hockey and all my buddies were hockey players. So I, I had that pull. Um, but at the same time, it's just, I just fell in love with the game right away. I was the kid that could go to the schoolyard and throw a ball up against the wall for hours on end. I didn't need anybody, you know, our, our, we had a family cottage on Lake Erie and, and our family would go there on vacation and I would just bring, my glove and a tennis ball and throw it up against the wall of our cottage. Like everyone's at the beach and carrying on. I'm just pitching games in my head over and over again. And um, I was really, really fortunate to grow up in North London and have a normal upbringing. You know, like when you talked about playing for Oak Ridge, like playing for North London, playing with um, the Burroughs family, the Thompson family. Like I grew up with Jeff Carter, like all these guys that it's no, surprised to me that so many of us have had a chance in professional sports because we pushed each other and we didn't it wasn't intentional it was in a schoolyard sort of way we played pickup basketball and we played like I even played some soccer and and volleyball and whatever came our way we just competed against each other um, so I think that that certainly worked to my advantage that I was in that environment and then um, again it, Thankfully, having that upbringing that I'm talking about, pre-social media, it was never 
in our face about like where are you ranked where do you fit in like you just mm -hmm. played you just competed and so fortunately for me the sort of things you're asking about in terms of the more serious side it wasn't until later in in my teenage years because i was so concerned for representing london like i just wanted to beat mississauga i just wanted to to win a provincial championship and then a national championship and then play for Ontario and then play for the national team. And then next thing you know, everything just aligned itself um, the way I hoped it would. And that was, I wanted to sign professionally at a high school and, and get at it and get playing professional baseball. So um, just fortunate to grow up in like in that, you know, London's a decent sized city. North London felt like a small little community mm -hmm. and, um, and we had that good kind of sandlot upbringing. Did, uh, you 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 were six a six time Canadian team member, are you not? Yep, that yeah. sounds about right. Yeah, about six times. Yeah. Well, you, you know he's done it a couple of times when he says it sounds about right. That just yeah. <laughs> that, that that means he's he's represented the country well. If, if there been yeah. uh, some big kind of highlights, obviously along the way, there, there's got to be a bunch. But is it hard to kind of narrow it down to a couple so far when you you throw the red and white on? Because it's one thing to you know put a, a major league jersey on and that kind of thing and go up th through that rank, but uh, is it a little more special when you get to throw the red and white on? Well. I always, and I still to this day, my favorite sporting event of the year is the World Junior Hockey Championships. So as a kid growing up and you're seeing 18, 19 year olds getting to play for their country um, in front of that sort of stage and audience, like it, it was just, I always was in awe of them. Um, and then I was fortunate enough when I was 16, um, I was going through tryouts. I got invited to try out with the Canadian junior national team, 18 and under team. And uh, again, like I, I was just worried about playing well. I wasn't, I, I hoped obviously I was going to make the team, but I was realistic that it was an 18 and under team and I was the only 16 year old there. Um, and so when I made the team, I was almost in shock. And, and that was a moment that it really hit me that like, I'm going to wear the Canadian uniform and the, and the world tournament was in Canada. It was going to be in front of our home audience. So all those feelings that I had watching the world juniors were going to come to fruition on a, obviously hockey baseball is not what hockey is. It's going to be on a smaller scale, but for us, it felt that way. So I, I would say that was the biggest moment I was in 2002. Um, and then along the way, I was part of that team in, in 2011 that won the Pan Am Games, which was the first gold medal that Canada has ever won in that tournament. So that was really, really special. And I think also it was a group of guys, Canadian guys that had been playing in those sorts of tournaments for a long time together. And it finally came together. It was always third place or fourth place or like just, we were just close hmm. and it finally went our way. And um, that was a really special moment, being on the podium and, and seeing the Baseball Canada staff, Greg Hamilton, who's been at it forever. And I mean, I, I'm sure the satisfaction for those guys, of all the hard work and investment in us players and everything that goes on behind the scenes um, must have been quite a thrill for them too. So there's nothing quite like it representing your country. Um, we're all proud Canadians. So um, those are, those are moments I'll remember really fondly. And unfortunately, um, our, your baseball career professionally always takes precedence in those situations. So I have had to, to miss some opportunities that I wish I wouldn't have had to with the national team. But um, anytime I can make it work, it's, it's really been a blast. Was Ernie Witt the manager of that team? He is, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then kind of for, you know, before we get to kind of where you're at right now and what the last little bit's been like, cause it's, uh, it's been, been a ride and a half, uh, across the board, but the last year I'm sure has been, you know, absolutely crazy top to bottom. Um, you know, you go back to, you know, go back to that Oh three draft, uh, you know, you're, you're, you talked about, you know, the, the buddies playing, uh, was playing some Sandlot in the North end of London and then mm -hmm. all sudden uh the fourth round comes around uh what was uh is it still uh you know do, can you still picture that uh that day and that night in the kind of you know as clearly as as it was yesterday kind of thing i can yep it was um 
you know, the way the draft works that it's not, it's not super random, you know, right before the draft leading up to it, what's more than likely going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, that said, it can sometimes really disappoint some guys, but in my situation, the night before I pretty much knew this area of the draft, that there was a couple teams that were insisting that that would be where I would go. So I had an idea going into it. Um, we took the day off school and all those buddies I mentioned earlier came over to the house and we were waving around and it was done. It was broadcasted over the radio through the internet. So we were huddled around the computer. And of course, in and around the second round, there was technical difficulties, not just at our house, like it was just something happened. So you can just, the stress of the moment is kind of getting at you a little bit, but I think I just distinctly remember listening to the names coming off the board, the draft board, and no matter what these teams tell you, the second you hear everyone else's name and it's John Smith, Arizona State, and Billy from North Carolina, and all these big name schools, and you're sitting there in North London, and you're out of high school, and you're sitting, like, how, where do I fit into any of this? Um, and then I, I, right where I thought or was told it would kind of happen for me, it did. And once I heard my name, it was just elation and relief, a lot of different excitement. Okay, this is real, like it's really happening. Um, you know, I was just super excited, um, grateful. I had, we had a good relationship with the Atlanta Braves um, area scout. And so was, I felt comfortable there and, and in an organization that drafted mainly high school guys. I knew I would um, have a peer group to go in with that I wouldn't be just a 17 year old kid surrounded by older college guys that were way ahead of me. Um, turns out I, everyone was way ahead of me anyway. So I had some work to do, but it was, uh, it was a great day. Peter. <laughs> Yeah, I was just, you said that, that there's two months of, of uh, spring training in Korea to bring it up to date. Yeah, so so spring training um, is going to start February 1st. So a okay. few days from now, um, and our opening day is April 3rd. So Third. it's uh, it's basically a two-month spring training. Mm -hmm. um, that's just, they do the same thing in Japan. It's just longer. That's kind of how... They've always done it. They don't take a whole lot of time off playing baseball here. Like even when our season ends, they go into a fall camp oh. and then they do a winter camp. And then we start early in spring training. It's basically, they kind of take two weeks off in, in December, but wow. otherwise they, they like to work. So hmm. um, yeah, it's, it begins shortly for me. There's a lot of, of, of sports enthusiasm in Korea. I know uh, I've, I've had some Korean friends here and all they talk about is sports and, and the young ladies that are on the LPGA, uh, you know, there's a good representation of Korean youth there. Uh, is there any hockey in Korea now? Uh, of course it goes to hockey. <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, I, I've known a couple of guys that have played in the OHL that are from Korea. Yeah, so there is. Um, they, they do play some hockey here. There used to be a team actually based in Incheon that played in a league that had teams in Russia and Japan. Um, okay. The team is, is no longer in Incheon. There was actually a goaltender from Clinton, Ontario, that mm -hmm. was on that team. Um, the na his name is slipping my mind right now, but we, we never met. But I, you know, I, everywhere I went in my area, they would say, oh, do you know this guy? Um, so yes, they do. There's a, there's a private school, a couple blocks down from where I live that there's a guy from Huntsville that played professional hockey that kind of heads up their hockey department there. Mm -hmm. uh, so he and I have become good friends and, and, um, coincidentally he, he played hockey with Jeff Burroughs professionally. It's just a small world. Like we're over in Korea and having a beer and, and it just somehow comes up that that, that happens. So, um, yeah, there is hockey is a distant, distant, I don't know, fifth to baseball or whatever in this country, but they are mad for sports for sure. And, and baseball is number one. They're, they're just, uh, they're crazy for it. Yeah. Those Burroughs brothers, they're internationally known. So we'll, uh, they are. 
leave yeah. it at that. Um, no, I know. Obviously, uh, I, I, Pete and I want to know all about kind of the, the, the kind of environment and everything that's going on over there. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you about a major league debut because uh, I'd be crazy if I didn't ask you about it. Uh, what, I know I've, I've I've had a chance to talk to you before. I know I've heard some. Uh, you know, there's there's a documentaries and stuff made on it, sort of thing. Um, you know, what was that uh, that that experience like? Because as you said, it's one thing to you know come into uh, you know being a young kid getting drafted and you know having to do the work because that just uh, um, I don't think a lot of people realize just how much work goes into it. I think a lot of people maybe just think uh, you know oh you get drafted you play a couple years later. It's obviously a lot different in baseball than it is uh, I think for than any other sport really. But uh, you get to that point with the major league debut. You, what was uh, what was that like uh, to kind of finally finally get to that spot and say you know is that kind of where it went you know what it's uh doesn't matter how long it lasts uh, i can still say you know that uh, you had that spot kind of thing as a major league debut you you're in the big stadium and everything like that what was that uh, that experience like for you when i got the phone call it's a phone call you you wait your whole life for um and, and when when it comes it, you're just in shock disbelief um it wasn't easy for me to get to that point um that's what makes it fun though and that's what makes it that much more rewarding i remember i called my wife she was in a meeting i couldn't get a hold of her and, and when this stuff happens it happens fast the manager calls you it's nine morning wake up you're going to the big leagues by the way like you have a flight in an hour and <laughs> trying to call everybody that needs to know these things and uh called my mom that was really emotional like she was she was very emotional um as you can imagine and, and racing through to get myself ready to go to the airport get to the airport and i hadn't eaten anything i just couldn't eat like i lost my appetite i i, and I think that went on for like three days where you're just it's almost like an out-of-body feeling like it it happened you know something you've worked your whole life towards it's so 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 unlikely that it's going to happen and then it does you almost can't believe it um and everything is fast and in, in your face especially la like when you go into that market i i remember coming out of the cab at the stadium and the documentary starts no warning just boom cameras in your face they don't leave you the whole time and you're walking into a clubhouse, which I was not in major league spring training with those guys. So this is a first for me to meet all these guys. And this is, at the time, was the highest payroll in sports history. So you're walking into a clubhouse full of Josh Beckett's and Kershaw's and Hanley Ramirez and Adrian Gonzalez and Matt Kemp and um, those sorts of guys, Zach Granke. And you're trying to get over the fact that it's, this is happening for you. And then you're trying to uh, go through the hoops of meeting everybody, introducing yourself. And um, and then you're getting called into the office to meet Don Mattingly. It's just like, this. Is, it's just ridiculous how it all happens. And um, Mark McGuire was the hitting coach. And this is a guy that, you know, as a hitter, I kind of idolized. Um, so you're getting over like that starstruck stuff. And then of course you have to play. Um, and then you walk out on the field and it's Dodger Stadium and there's, you know, five decks of stands. And it was uh, it was really exciting. I just remember that first night. Unfortunately, everything happened so fast. My family couldn't get there for the first day. Um, but I, I really just wanted to play like it, it, get out there, get the, get your feet under you. And um, and luckily got to pinch hit that night. And uh, it was just awesome. You know, the ovation that comes with it. They gave you gave me a second. They uh, kind of a courtesy. They do a mound visit and they announce it making his major league debut. And, um, you know, just feeling ready. Like I was ready. I was ready for all of it. Um, it was it was a great experience. It was enormously challenging coming from being an everyday player to taking random late inning at bats against some of the best pitchers in baseball that are paid a lot of money to get everybody out. Um, so it was. Uh, a huge challenge and uh, a great learning experience because I knew that the next time it came up, it was likely going to be a similar situation. And so when it did happen for me the following year, I felt much more prepared. 
where where does the uh, where does the ball sit? Because I know everybody's got the story. The first hit it, did did that automatically go to mom's ha- mom, or did that have to sit somewhere on your own shelf? Because I know uh, we've we everybody seems to have a that one stayed with me, or it automatically went to a parent. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that and other uh, memorable moments. They're all with me for now. Um, there's no special place as of yet we just moved uh, a couple years ago and the fact that i'm really never home has like we're just not all the way settled yet and um with two kids like my 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 trophy case is priority number 10 versus everything else so um i have them don't worry about that but uh there's no special spot for them just yet but um great like it was uh it was really fantastic and um you know everything you could dream it would be you, you uh, let's get up to the here and now ryan uh, if we may uh, jamie uh, you said that uh, uh when we, we before we signed on that your club has just been sold and and uh, it's a new group of owners is that going to be a big challenge or anything will change for you um, I, I'm sure there's some ease and unease in our front office right now because, you know, the parent group. So how it works in Korea is these massive conglomerate corporations own all the sports franchises. And when they come in and, and purchase the team, they install their own people um, from a business perspective within the front office to help run the operations side of it. So we did a little bit of we had a bad year last year and they cleaned and they installed a lot of new people within SK um, in some high-ranking positions. And now we have a whole new ownership group coming in. So I'm sure there's some unease in the front office with what that's going to look like. Um, From my perspective, nothing changes. Uh, They inherit our club. They inherit the contracts. All that stays the same. Um, I, I know that when this has happened in, in this league, typically the new owners that come in are anxious to spend. They want to invest. They they want to make a splash. They want to do stuff to prop up the team. So I look at it as, as nothing but positive. I think there's great opportunity. We have a good team. It didn't work out last year, but I think we can definitely bounce back. So um, probably it'll, it'll be an interesting buzz in spring training and hopefully in an exciting way. What's, what's the, you know, for, for, people who don't know and obviously we're going to have a fair amount of viewership from kind of our area and, and, and kind of throughout sort of thing uh you know what's the what's the baseball environment like what's the the, the day-to-day kind of thing like because i know for maybe those who aren't international travelers they're kind of going I, you know i know for me anytime uh, my wife and i talk about going anywhere she says i have a feeling you're probably gonna have to try and find a, a ballpark or two that you have to check out um which is always the case but uh you know what, what's the environment like and what's uh w- what's the season like for you guys um the environment is amazing it, it's um we play in a stadium that seats about twenty six thousand people um it can be a little bit slow tuesday wednesday thursday through the week but the other um the weekends are almost always sold out depending on who we're playing um there's some teams in this league that travel really well so they, they have such a strong fan base that their fans will follow them anywhere Mm-hmm. So they'll have their own section on their side, and then our side is jammed out. But um, baseball here is an event. It's not They're not just coming to watch a game. They're coming to participate in being a fan. So there's the cheer songs. Um, there's the cheerleaders. There's the constant um, music and dancing and singing and um and food and drinking and carrying on like it's just wild it, it really is an electric experience um it's loud it's it's electric it never stops like there's no here's the music and then you start hitting and it stops it's not like that it just keeps going um and that's through the ninth inning win or lose so it's uh it really is an event it's like it's kind of a mix of sports and a concert at the same time and people expats that i talk to that I that I meet in Inchon that come through, they're just amazed. Like they all say the same thing. Like I, I thought I knew baseball and then I came and watched this. It's just totally different. Um, it it will make American baseball seem really quiet. Huh. Um, 
and it, it really is a very fan friendly and fan service league where everything is done with entertainment purpose in mind. Um, we're certainly encouraged and kind of demanded as players to interact with the fans, sign for the fans. Um, there's, there's no just walking by them and brushing them off and, and fans of you as a player and fans of the teams individually, it's almost like a cult like falling. Like once they're your fan, they're going to buy your Jersey. They're going to buy all your memorabilia and they're going to support you basically no matter what. Um, and it's pretty neat. It really is. It's um, they've been really warm, you know, speaking for myself and, and my family, they've people of Korea have been really warm and welcoming to us. And I certainly being that I've been here, this will be five years um, in the neighborhood that I live in. Like it feels like community to me. So um, we really like it. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's just been a great experience. You mentioned uh, it's an event. What, what's the ultimate event? Do you have a world series? Something like, something like that? Yeah, we call it um, the Korean series. Um, we, 2018, um, our club won it. And it was probably the, the ba one of the biggest highlights in my baseball career. It was really amazing. We had a great team. Um, we had great management our fans, like it was sold out and electric every night. Um, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about that stuff. Like it was just, it's a long year, right? Like we leave home it, towards the end of January and don't get back until well into November. And all the work and all the stresses of the season, and um, as fun as it is here, it, this is a pressure cooker. There's the media presence and the fan presence comes with huge expectations. So with all that being said, to come down and go through it and win, um, there's no better feeling in, in those moments and playing in those atmospheres. Like it, it was totally amazing. Uh, obviously this past year, everything's gone, everything sideways across uh, around the world sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 everywhere in the world has experienced things differently sort of thing. What was the, uh, A, the, the kind of, you know, beginning of what was inevitably a worldwide pandemic, but I uh, want to talk about kind of how you guys came out of this as kind of the uh, the, the first images the world kind of saw of what, uh, you know, some sports fans could say it was normality, but when did uh, when did things become, uh, you know, obviously serious from a, a changes perspective for you guys? And then kind of we'll talk about uh, kind of the, the other elements of it and kind of the, the how things picked back up. There was a there was a church congregation from Korea that spent time in Wuhan at the outbreak at the beginning of all of this, and so they come back to Korea. They spread it in throughout their congregation. This is in a, a city called Daegu. Um, it gets picked up upon quickly. Uh, Korea went through the SARS pandemic like they were very well prepared for how this could spread and what this would probably look like. So essentially, they. Of the, the cases are booming, but they're booming in a small area. And so they basically shut the city down, completely lock it down, um, do a great job of containing it. And so from that period of time in, in probably January um, through to when we were set to go there in March, there was, it was very well contained and it was starting to trend downwards to where, um, you know, from, from our perspective as a, as a family, we felt comfortable going there. Now, at that time, there wasn't much going on on the Western side of the world with it. So there was, like I was being asked all the time, like, do you think this is a great idea? Do you think this is the safest place to be right now and all that? And then the irony of it became that it was the safest place to be. Um, it only got worse and worse. So, and we're still going through it in Canada and the US and whatnot. So, it was very slow when I first got to Korea um, it, in the sense that while things were open, they were just encouraging the citizens to stay home. And it's a, it's a country that has no issue getting public consensus. When, when they're told to do something, people fall in line. So the streets were very, very quiet. Um, our team encouraged us to grocery shop and then do our own cooking, stay out of the restaurants, stay out of the bars. Um, just basically when you're 
you're, you're not at the stadium, stay at home as much as you can. Um, so it was quiet, but as things continued to get better it, and restrictions eased a little bit, I think the team felt more comfortable with like, it's okay for you to go to dinner, but still take it easy. And, um, and it quickly got back to fairly normal quality of life, aside from wearing a mask and, and sanitizing your hands there, you didn't, you didn't really notice a whole lot of difference. And it got to the point, you know, later in the season, not even later, maybe midway through the season where you'd go out for dinner in a packed restaurant and no one's wearing a mask and you don't think anything of it. And, and we were at zero or near zero cases in a country of 53 million people for an extended period of time. And then there, there was a little flare up again. Um, but our, I say our, the flare ups here are very minimal, relatively speaking, and, and the reaction is very strong, relatively speaking. So, um, They've done a good job containing it. And, and for that reason, I think it was us in, in Taiwan were able to get started on basically delayed, but run a regular schedule. Um, you know, we tried fans a couple times and the fan situation is not an issue. It's just how the, the government regulations line up. So if you if they say we can't have outdoor gatherings that exceed 100 people, well, obviously we're not going to have stadiums full of people. but um, we did eventually get some fans and that was a big boost because it was really challenging coming off playing in these big electric environments and then going to a point where you can hear everything the other teams dug out is saying across the field. It was really strange. Uh, North Korea. Is there any, any interaction with North Korea in, in the baseball world over there? No, zero. There's a, uh, it's interesting, you know, my first year in 2017, I came at like the height of the rhetoric between Trump and Kim Jong-un. And it was, you know, we, you watch CNN and we get our Western news and it's just so in our face. You basically thought the world was, was going to end. And then you come into the clubhouse and ask the Korean guys and they just, they're just laughing. They're like, oh, this, this has gone on since the beginning of time. This will continue to go on. Basically, nothing's going to happen. Just They just sweep it under the rug. Um, there's also being over here, you know, a lot of stuff that goes on between South and North Korea that we're not really privy to in, in a positive way. So, um, we're certain we get an interesting side of information from it. It's not entirely true. Um, so they don't feel like we certainly, you, you certainly don't get the feeling that there's any, um, anything negative imminent, um, just kind of go about their day. And, and play baseball and um, yeah, there's, it's uh, it's basically a non-factor. But there's from a baseball perspective, there's no interaction with that sort of stuff. And if you want to have those sorts of conversations with your teammates, I've found that it's it's pretty split their feelings. You know, some people, the family lineage, they have family members there. Um, so some people are in favor of reunification, and others aren't. Um, so it's interesting talking to guys about that stuff but it's certainly a different conversation when you say north korea here versus if you say it on our side of the world yeah uh you mentioned the fact that you know the the season was able to kind of start up with you know a couple of hiccup obviously and changes and that kind of element sort of thing but um all of a sudden you know as you mentioned things in this kind of the world kind of keep uh, kind of April, March, April, May, all of a sudden, uh, March over here, obviously Canada wise, uh, things kind of start changing a little bit with, with lockdowns and shutdowns and, um, you know, and then all of a sudden uh, there's no sports anywhere. And then all of a sudden there's talk of Korean baseball is going to start. Um, and then all of a sudden ESPN says, we're going to put Korean baseball on TV. Uh, all, you know, I'm sure like everything in the world, uh, you know, anybody can probably tune into a live stream of, of game or kind of get their, their own way of getting, uh, you know, uh, family members I'm sure can watch along with games on, you know, online and that kind of thing. Uh, what was, uh, you know, did it seem all of a sudden, did it go from you know, a select group of friends and family kind of uh, checking in and watching games to all of a sudden, you know they're they're up at certain points of the morning and kind of saying, "Hey, Jamie, we caught your uh, caught your game today." Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm sure a few buddies and all of a sudden a few more messages coming your way. It did, yeah. It was uh, almost in an instant. Um, 
the phone starts blowing up and, and people are at the beginning of it when let's say ESPN took it on, um, you know, there's a lot of broadcasters and commentators that um, seeing as they're professionals in this business, they need to be versed in Korean baseball. So a lot of conversations with broadcasters, like tell us about this player, tell us why they're doing this, tell us, you know, countless, a lot of hours on the phone um, talking Korean baseball with people. Um, exciting moment for the league though, when you think about it, um, huge opportunity for exposure. Um, tons of, yeah, tons of messages from teammates, old, old teammates, people you fall out of touch with that just so happen to be up early in the morning or their kids got them up and they flip on ESPN and say, Hey, I know that guy sort of thing. Um, so it was, uh, it was busy at times. I, I probably did 50 interviews over the course of the year. There were times where it was like three in a row back to back to back and I would just joke with people like when there's nothing else going on in the world, like I'm the guy you call. Like that's what it was kind of coming to. But it was uh, I was happy to do it and um, created some new relationships and, and whatnot. But um, it was it was a great opportunity for the KBO and one that I think it's going to continue. Probably not on the scale that it was with ESPN, but I think they'll continue to have some games broadcasted at least through that network and. Um, for that reason, like the exposure globally and, and what that does is it brings to light the fact that we recognize baseball, let's say in Canada, as we associate that with Toronto Blue Jays and then Major League Baseball, but there are quote unquote major leagues outside of our major league. Um, and the quality of play in Japan is phenomenal and Korea is a tier below Japan. Um, but those three leagues present um, in many ways like a major league stage for, for professional baseball. And, uh, and I think it brought light to that. And for that reason, it was all worthwhile taking those calls and, and talking about it. Um, it was really neat. Well, I want to wish you the very best. I don't know uh, how long we're going to go, Ryan, but uh, I'd like to wish you the very best, Jamie. I know uh, it's been, uh, it's been a great uh, learning experience for me talking to you and and all we can do is wish you the very very best this coming year i was gonna say that it takes a lot to get him to actually learn something new at this point because we <laughs> figure it he's probably forgot more about sports than most of us can ever <laughs> take in um if uh, you sound old oh not not in the least <laughs> I, I want to bring up this uh, this photo here and uh correct me if i'm wrong is this the home stadium that's it yeah, that's uh, what, what's that's that environment like? Because when I look at that, obviously, I'm sure this. I'm just pulling up, you know, Google image sort of thing. But um, I'm sure this is from uh, obviously a couple of years ago. 2015, I think is the timeline on it. But um, it, when you say, you know, for for those fans who kind of talk about major league ballparks, that a it's a great looking ballpark, <laughs> and uh, b what's that environment like? Amazing, and um, it, it's. You know, I, I've played in some environments similar, like, for example, when I played in Venezuela in the wintertime, Venezuela is loud and electric, but it's hostile. It, it's you don't want to strike out in a big spot in Venezuela. Um, this hmm. is more enthusiastic. It's more positive. It's more supportive. Um, it's fun. Like, it, it really is a great it, it's super cool to look up in the stands and see a lot of people wearing your jersey. I think that's a really interesting, like that that will stick with me for a long time. Um, it, you know, it's it's an upper, it's an adrenaline rush. You know, you wake up in the morning and you know that that sort of environment is in front of you that night. And, and it's it's not just that, it's it after the game, if you go out for dinner, all the little restaurants and bars, like as you're walking through, I can see them as I drive back into my neighborhood. It's all over the big screen, like the, the highlights, the low lights, the replays, all that stuff. It's their national sport. So they're all about it. Um, it's a very uh, eating and, and carrying on is a very sociable thing to do in Korea. It's popular. That's what they do. They work extremely hard and then they go out. So they watch all those games together and they carry on. and. For that reason, um, when it's good, 
it's great. You walk into a place and, you know, people are really excited to see you. And is this like a with Kawhi Leonard with Kawhi and dine? Do you, does Romack eat for free if the game goes well <laughs> that night? I've had some, I've had some pretty nice di- dinners that I didn't pay for, for sure. Yeah. It's the people are great. You know, it doesn't take much. You sign, you take a picture with them and then you go to get up and leave later that night. And they said, no, it's, it's all taken care of. Don't worry about it. So um, that's why I say they've been really warm towards me. It's been great. Um, but there is, you do take, there's good and bad to it too. There's not a lot of um, privacy or freedom with that mm-hmm. sort of lifestyle. And um, you bring the bad with you too post game. So if I want to go grab a bite to eat and just struck out three times, um, it's not that they're going to be on you about it, but I know what they're, they're looking at me in a different way. And it's like, you know, I just, I know chase something to that. Like, I just, oh, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I'll do better next time <laughs> because the expectations are really high. Um, they almost seem to think that you're robotic in what you can do. So, um, you know, I certainly go through plenty of down periods here. So it, uh, there's times where you just want to grab some takeout and kind of get out of there. But, um, but but overall it's been they're super supportive and it's great it's uh it's a fun part of my life because i feel like i'm almost living two lives i i do that and then i come home and then you just jump into the real world like everybody else like nothing like nothing like that didn't even didn't even exist a couple days ago so it's great and i would be remiss if i let you go without saying vado jason bay larry walker Jamie Romack, all Tip O'Neill winners. Uh, you know, t- take me through what, what that experience was like as well, because that's uh, obviously uh, that that's the yeah you you you're, you're up with there with baseball royalty in Canada being the Tip O'Neill winner. That uh, that had to be a big uh, a big kind of highlight as well. Not not an on field highlight, but uh, being named the winner of the, the Tip O'Neill award. Yeah, it, it's well. First of all, like I, I didn't feel comfortable when you say those those names. Um, but it is something I'm really proud of. I, I instantly think back to all of the things I've mentioned in terms of coming from being a product of a community of, of people here. It just seemed like such a, an award that could be shared collectively um, because it was, it was just a product of having a good environment growing up. And I felt like it, was, um, it wasn't so much just about this year, it was about many years of, of being at it and um, wanted to share with you know, all the coaches I had growing up and all the, the teammates I played with and all the guys that I still see you know, every day in the off season working out at center field sports and all the, the, that group of guys. Like I, I just felt like it was, it was all of us. Um, so I, I'm happy um, that it brought the light to local baseball in London because as I alluded to earlier, there's been a lot of good players come out of this, this area. And, um, and hopefully this doesn't put London baseball on the map, but it, it keeps us on the map and hopefully, and there's more coming. There's some, it's going to be impressive. There's some really, really great things cooking that have been kind of under the surface um, that are not so much under the surface anymore. There's some great players. They're going to go to some big schools. They're going to get drafted. Um, and you know, it's a game of attrition. So you got to kind of flood the, the system, but if you keep producing players and giving them enough of them a chance, you're going to see some guys on TV sooner rather than later. Um, and I can't wait. I, I can't wait, um, to just watch the next generation and, um, and cheer them on as, uh, because it's important to always have that person or group of people in front of you to say like, okay, that's the goal. And then once they're out, then you become the goal. And then it just hopefully continues that cycle. Um, but we're really well positioned. I think there's great things going on with the Great Lake Canadians and, um, and what's going on in that program. So there's uh, the future is definitely really bright. I think. 
who, who are those couple? And I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you can't say them all, but there's got to be a few guys that you're kind of going uh, for those, you know, you know those, the everyday kind of sports fans of the area that obviously when we kind of, you know, flag wave, they're, they're, you know, they're local representatives and those guys sort of thing. Who are the names that uh, maybe that, uh, as you say, they're, they're no longer kind of under the radar, but those names that some guys have kind of uh, fans have got to be like, I got to, I got to keep an eye on this name sort of thing. Well, I think Adam Hall is the big one. I think when you talk in terms of local guys, this guy went to Lucas High School. Um, he played for the Badgers. He, put, he played for the Great Lake Canadians. He came up. He's a he's a London guy. Um, got drafted in the second round. He's as well positioned as anybody to to make the major leagues. He's he's on the right track. Um, he loves baseball. Um, he works hard at it. He's, I don't, I wouldn't bet against him. I don't think he's going to be denied. Um, so I think he's a name, sure. I think that um, there's a group coming up probably this year in the draft. There's there's a kid, um, they're not local kids, but and I, I think this speaks to kind of what's going on within the program in London is that people are willing to drive a long ways to come and, and play for this program. So there, there's a kid from the Tri-Cities area uh, <clears throat> named Calvin Ziegler, who's been up to 97. He's done all the big circuits and done really, really well. Um, he's a real, it's a really good arm. Um, there's a kid named Eric Sarantola that's on, has been through the program is at Mississippi State, who's probably peeking into the end of the first round or second round if the draft were today. Um, been up to 100 miles an hour, huge six foot five massive kid um the cool thing from my perspective coming and going i get to see them on the way in in just a small spurt so when they're in 11th grade and they come in and they look like baby deer and they throw 75 and then every year when they come back and i come back and you're like geez that looks really good and it just keeps getting better and better um there, there's uh, there's a guy named Miles Gordon that came through the program that uh, he's uh, he's a free agent right now, but he's just coming into his own. He's still in his early mid twenties. He's out of Oakville. That he's a really good looking, talented player um, that hopefully will find a home. There, there's some more interesting guys too, and, and the other ones. There's sometimes guys that aren't so much the big names, but every time you see them, you're like this guy's going to play professional baseball at some point and you don't even think about it. You just like, he just goes quietly behind the scenes and then it will somehow work out. Um, there's a kid that I know the program's all really proud of um, out of Sarnia. We've known him since he was six years old. His name's Dylan O'Ray. He just committed to the university of Illinois. Um, and he's, he's in, he's in his junior year of high school. So he's still a young kid. Um, phenomenal baseball player off the charts makeup phenomenal student um but just grow up grew, grew up playing local baseball and just comes from a good bunch that uh in that western counties area they're all really close um there's been a tremendous amount of kids out of uh out of the wyoming area there's a kid named core jackson who just committed to nebraska who's if the draft were bigger and longer as a sh like you might still get drafted surefire draft type guy the list goes on like how long can i stay here like this is, <laughs> it is there is an enormous group of talented kids that whether it's going to happen for them out of high school or out of college it's going to happen at some point they're on the right track um and it's 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 exciting you know i listen like i'm as I said, I come and go. The core tenants of that program, Adam Stern, Chris Robinson, Brock Kilgard, John Fitzsimmons, Brad McElroy, um, the list goes on and Jeff Helps, um, Shane Davis, all those guys, what they're doing is creating essentially mini professionals. Um, and they're doing it in a way that obviously encourages academics because those two go hand in hand and, and really, you want to be a great ball player but it, if you had to be better at one you'd really rather be a better student there's a lot of academic money out there for those kids um and they're just really they've done really well they have a good formula and system in place that produces players 
And um, I think a lot of people in the local community and certainly the local sports community would be shocked to know some of the high ranking people in professional baseball that, have, that now know where Dorchester, Ontario is, you know, like there, there's been, <laughs> there's been a lot of uh, influential people come through to see local baseball players there. And uh, I think that's a really cool thing. And I think that's something that, you know, I, I think should be talked about and um, because there's going to be a lot of kids coming out of this program in this area for years to come. Well, I, I could I could talk baseball with you for like four hours, but I'm sure you've got to, you've got some things to do to prep for a season. So I don't want to keep you too long, but uh, no, definitely uh, for those who you know in the area, if they if they haven't been out to that uh, absolutely fantastic facility out in Dorchester, it's uh, it's it's absolutely gorgeous. I know for me, it's almost one of those fields where myself, I kind of go, I'm like, I'd love to hit out here. But I'll, even I'm a little bit at times where I'm like, might be a little too nice for me. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, obviously, best of luck with, uh, you know, I know spring training for, for a couple months is probably a little lengthy. But at the same point, uh, I would be remiss if I said I wasn't a little jealous that, uh, you know, as you say, you know, the weather's OK, palm trees, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, another successful year to you and uh, um, and kind of you know, on behalf of all those kids in the area that, that you have inspired sort of thing, um, you know, obviously uh, fantastic work. And, uh, and you know, thanks for all the inspiration for all those kids because I'm so, sure as much as you're impressed with them, I'm sure they're kind of looking at you as, uh, you know, the the guy they're looking up to sort of thing. So uh, that's that's got to mean a lot sort of thing, right? I really appreciate yeah. that. Um, I don't know. I hope so. And, and I, I certainly don't. It's a motivation um, if they are not to let them down. So I've... Uh, I, I'm a proud Canadian. I carry that with me throughout every season. Um, so I appreciate those words and hopefully just some good health and uh, it'll be a great year. Thanks, Jamie. Jamie. Thanks so much Thank for you your guys. time, my friend. And uh, we will uh, hopefully talk to you soon. Feel free to let us know, uh, you know, how the season goes. And I know for uh, for me, I'm, I'm even I've, uh, I've, I've caught a couple of games online. But when it was, uh, you know, when it was able to for my daughter, you, exact situation for me. Uh, my daughter woke me up, and all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a second, I can turn to you. <laughs> Baseball in the morning is a beautiful thing. So there you go, uh, yeah. Jamie. Thanks so much for this, and uh, we'll hopefully talk again soon. Thank you, guys. Thanks okay, for having Jamie. me. Bye bye.